But welcome to Kermit Uncut. We're joined by Josh Larson, who you may well know from the Film Spotting podcast. He's also just written a new book called Movies Are Prayers. Josh, uh, welcome to uh, Kermit Uncut. First, Thank you. On the subject of movie podcasts, you have a very, very successful movie podcast, and it takes a lot for me to say that. <laughs> Why do you think movies and podcasts have worked so well together? Why are so many people interested in movie podcasts? Well, first I jumped on the coattails of a very successful movie podcast. I joined in 2011 and my co-host Adam Kempenar started it with our producer, Sam Van Hogren in 2005. Okay. So it's the conversation that we've all had after seeing a movie with our friends. This is just shared with a larger group and those people become friends because as with your show with Simon, we're very dependent on listener feedback. Yeah, We hear what the listeners think of the movies, share that and it becomes just a bigger conversation that we can all have together. I think that's the key. Do you have any sense of what kind of people listen to film spotting? Is it film nerds, film fans, or is it general audience? Uh, it's hardcore film nerds at the center, but it expands beyond that. And as we grow, I think we're getting more mainstream movie fans who are beginning to think about becoming more hardcore fans. Okay. So we get people when we will do like a Satchiget Ray marathon, they'll join us for the first times they've seen those films and then eventually we'll bring them in deeper. So explain to those who haven't heard it exactly what a film spotting podcast sounds like. So we usually start with a main review Chicago, of a new film. It could be a popular one, but if there's something smaller we're interested in, we'll do that as well. Yeah. And then we almost always have a top five list. So top five bicycle scenes or related to the book, we just did top five religious experiences at the movies. So Adam and I both shared those. I do think that the reason that movie podcasts, when they're done well, are working well is because they are like, as you said, the conversation that you would have when you come out of a movie, you, you know, you go to a pub, you go to a coffee bar, you immediately discuss films. And it always seemed to me that the point about film criticism was in some ways to replicate that enthusiasm that people have immediately afterwards. What did you think? What did you like? What did you not like? You have a very similar take on it, as it seems to me. Yeah, for sure. And then dig into that a little bit more because everyone does do that but we don't we wouldn't necessarily want to listen to all of our friends either <laughs> right so we hope that we're able to offer a few insights or talk about the particulars of the movie that touched us whether it's production design or something like that yeah, yeah. and then dig a little bit deeper into it i wrote a book in which i was getting very worried about the rise of internet criticism but at the end of which i decided that actually internet criticism in its best versions was every bit as good as print journalism if not better is that your own experience, or do you think that specialist film criticism is in trouble? No, it, it took me a while to get to that point because mm -hmm. I'm from the newspaper age too as well, so it was a little, how is this working? Why is everyone talking now? But especially when I joined Film Spotting, I realized that there are just as smart listeners out there who know as much about film, are as passionate, and so this, this gives them a chance to, whether it's a blog or emailing into our show or leaving us a voicemail to actually get their literal voice on the air yeah. and there's different voices too it's not the same you know five white guys so you can get some different perspectives as well now that things have been democratized to a certain degree tell me about the inspiration for the book and what is it actually about because it sounds like a particular kind of book but i think it's different to what people expect sure so movies are prayers is something i did separate from film spotting we're very much more of a mainstream our audience is more mainstream yeah. but um, my day job is as editor of a faith and culture website thinkchristian.net so there we're talking about how can the christian faith um, where is it reflected in culture? Because we're Christians, what do we make of the culture? And it's, it's celebratory, it's affirming, um, rather than a fearful approach. So that informed this idea I had of looking at movies as different forms of prayer. So if you think about forms of Christian prayer, confession or obedience or praise or lament, very common lament, I recognize that if I didn't know how to lament, say, over something I was feeling, I would go to a movie that would offer that, that experience up and it was as if the movie was doing it for me. So something like Chinatown is, mm -hmm. is such a, a film of lament. And if you happen to see that where you're at that point in your life, that ending, it feels as if the movie is speaking for you by just throwing up its hands and saying, forget it, it's Chinatown. That's a prayer of lament. One of the things that you're doing is talking about movies as being a transcendent art form. And that seems to me to be something which actually transcends a particular uh, religious faith. I've written a lot about movies that I have found transcendent, which have often been horror films. Um, you're not specifically talking about a single religious uh, outlook, are you? Well, I'm speaking from a Christian outlook, so I begin broader than that and talk about one of the forms of prayer I discuss is prayers of yearning, which I think are universal. It's this idea of what is this place and why am I in it, which just about everyone has who's alive. 
And those are things that we offer up, we express outward. And films, especially science fiction, I found, do that quite well. But then I do narrow down because I wanted to you know, speak from my own experience mm -hmm. and from what I knew well to look at more specific Christian types of prayer. I made a documentary and wrote a book about Shawshank Redemption some time ago, and I found that the key to uh, understanding why people loved that film so much, which the first time I saw it, I liked it, but I didn't get why it had such a big effect on people. And we spoke to the guys from HollywoodJesus.com and they had a very sort of particular religious reading of it. And it seemed to me that the more you looked at that text, the more it offered itself up as something which could be read spiritually. Now, oddly enough, in a very secular way, I think it's about the church of cinema as opposed to the sort of Christian church. But it is a film which clearly taps into a need, a desire, a want, a yearning that a huge uh, number of its audience have. Yeah, there's definitely something there to it. And it's both broad that you're talking about where it's secular religion, but also very specific. And, and in your book, you teased out in the character of Red, very theological ideas like the difference between redemption and atonement. And that's some, you know, hardcore theology stuff that you're finding in a book that I do think is there. I hadn't thought about it that way before. So here's where I appreciated someone else's criticism. But it is definitely there. And again, maybe not where the movie, where the filmmakers meant for it to go or the actors meant for it to go. But you read it in there and other audiences are reading other spiritual things in that film. And that's got to be a reason why it's so popular, because I think I had a similar experience of admiration for it. Never, never would have predicted that it would have been this big, this beloved of a title. What do you think is the, and this sounds like a silly question, but what do you think is the most spiritual experience you've had in the cinema, the most transcendent experience, the defining moment for you in which you were taken you know, out of yourself by a film? Well, thankfully, Adam and I just did that list on film spotting, the top five religious experiences. I'll, so, go I'll spoil my number one. Okay. The podcast was out last week, so that's fine. The Tree of Life. It's the creation sequence. And that was, as I said on the show, watching it, I didn't know it was coming. Felt like Genesis was washing over me. Felt like what I was seeing and living what I had heard about since I was a boy and heard stories about here I was experienced what it experienced what it might have been like to witness that sort of creation. And right. Tree of Life is, you know, it's just one of the greats. I'm gonna go for the dream sequence from The Exorcist because it scared the living daylights out of me and I have never felt more alive than being in that cinema with that very short, it's like 45 seconds long, yeah. the subliminal flash of the demonic face, which is Eileen Dietz. And to this day, I, I remember it was like a lightning rod moment and not because the film was dealing with religion, which it was, but because sure. of pure cinematic transcendence. What age was that? I was... 17. So okay. I was old enough. Old enough, yeah, but yeah, enough. still, yeah. still, yeah. yeah. Uh, look, it, it's uh, very, very nice to meet you after all this time. I think one of the lovely things about, you know, podcasts and the rest of it is it has become hands across the ocean that we are all sort of getting to sort of share each other's work. So I wish you many more years of doing it. And uh, I hope to come on your podcast at some point in the future, which would be great. And congratulations on the book. We will absolutely have you on. Thank you. Nice to see you, Josh.